The Old Testament reading for Septimagisma is from Exodus chapter 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We speak the gradual together. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 10. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do, do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ." Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the Holy Gospel. We read the tract together. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last workers worked only work one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text is Matthew 21 to 16, and also we'll look at Matthew 19, 16 to 30, especially the last few verses there, 27 to 30, uh, which you can find in your pew Bible on page 1048, page 1048. First Sunday of pre-Lent, Septuagesima, about 70 days before Easter, and uh, we look at the laborers laboring in the Lord's vineyard and what they will find. You can see the outline in your bulletin. Let us pray. These are your words, O Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, dear friends, work matters to God. It has since the very beginning. When even before sin fell upon God's first human beings, they were kicked out of the garden. Adam was told to work, to labor, and keep the garden, to tend to it, to be a, a steward of God's creation, to take care of it. Of course, now after the fall into sin, things have changed. And now, work is no longer, for most people, a joy. Work is a burden, it's a drudgery, it's painful, and many work for the wrong motivation or they have no motivation at all to work. And talking with different people, I know right now we are short on workers, we are short on laborers in many different areas of industry in our country, aren't we? From healthcare workers to even pastors. We need laborers, we need workers. But a summation of all the work that God has called each man to in all vocations of life, and if you care to know more about this, I had a longer sermon originally, but I took sections out. Uh, there was other points on working all throughout the Old Testament and labor, but this, I think, sums it up well. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, all work, all labor should be done to the glory of God. And not for what I can get out of it. And that's hard with our sinful flesh, isn't it? You know your sinful flesh. You know your sinful heart, don't you? You also know the new man resides in you as well that fights off the sinful heart. But you know the constant daily battle you face, the constant temptations you face, the idol of me, myself, and I in everything. And dear friends, you must repent of that selfish, self-centered, self-righteous focus in your life. Repent daily and turn and walk in the Lord's ways and not your own ways by grace through faith. Well, to understand the purpose and point of this parable in our gospel about workers, workers, laborers in the Lord's vineyard, we need the context. So we go back to chapter 19 and we look specifically at verse 19 uh, 27, where Peter says, we have left everything and followed you, Jesus. We've left the fishing business. We've left being a tax collector. We've left all these things. What then will there be for us? What are we going to get out of it? What are you going to pay us, Jesus, for all our hard work for you? <laughs> we might probably get more than any other workers, right? Because we were first. We were the first disciples that you called to come and work for you in your vineyard. Now, most likely, Peter and the other disciples, he's kind of the spokesman, right, for all of them, they were captivated by the previous lesson that Jesus taught the rich young ruler. He told him at the end, give up all your riches and follow me if you want to be saved. If, and you will have what? Treasures in heaven. 
But the rich man, he went away sad. He went away grieving because he had a lot of possession, a lot of riches, a lot of stuff, a lot of mammon. But Peter chimes in after he hears this and says, hey, look at us, Jesus. We did leave everything behind to follow you. Are there then lots of treasures for us? But sadly, both Peter and the other disciples, they're really lost in their understanding. Their works, self-centered righteousness is present. And it needs to be tempered. It needs to be killed. To be taught correctly about the work and rewards in the Lord's vineyard, in the Lord's kingdom. For all rewards in Jesus' kingdom are not by our works. They're not by me, myself, and I and what I can do, my efforts to earn favor with God, but they are by what? Grace alone. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, that is the key that they need to learn, and so many Christians do still today. And yet notice Jesus' initial response in 1928 to 29 before he then warns them leading into the parable. He graciously gives the first disciples not a scolding, but instead he tells them about all the rewards that he is blessing them with, both here and now and also in the future. And Mark and Luke's version of this account are a little bit more clear than Matthew's because they say not only these first disciples receive these, but all those who have given up everything for following Jesus, and even, it says, everyone, meaning all disciples, all believers, all faithful followers of Jesus, will receive what? A hundredfold now in this time. An abundance of rewards and blessings. And even more rewards and blessings in the age of eternal life. I think we often like to focus just on heaven and the rewards and blessings and benefits of being with Jesus after we die and on the last day, and we still we don't really focus on what he says here about the rewards for everyone right now. So many blessings the Lord gives out to us, laboring in the kingdom of heaven right now. But Jesus must make his point even clearer than with this strong warning before telling them the parable. And he says, he warns them, but many who are first, that is those currently already in the kingdom, namely you disciples who have called, you will be last, that is if you continue in this self-righteous belief and many who are last, that is not in my kingdom, who I am calling into work and labor, by my grace, they, in the end, will be first. The first point in the first half of our parable for today of the laborers in the vineyard is that there is no unemployment for all of, listen to this closely, the legit faithful workers. That is, all who work solely by God's grace through faith in Jesus. There's no unemployment. There's always work. Many are called in to work at all hours of the day, and there's always plenty of work to do, and generous pay, too. Generous rewards and blessings. But sadly, there is a misunderstanding about the work and pay in his kingdom amongst one particular group. The early first called workers at 6 a.m. What's very important for us to, to notice about these early workers is what we read in verse 2, that the workers agreed to be paid a certain amount. A certain amount contracted for their work, and that is a denarius a day, a full day's wage, a fixed wage. That's the agreement, fair and square. The first hour workers asked for this and agreed with the master for their pay, and that's what they could expect, right? Right? No arguments. This is what you're getting, and you wanted this. No grumbling, no blaming the master for being unjust, evil, or unfair, for making those other later called workers equal to them in pay and rewards, if that's what he agreed with them to pay them. But on the other hand, all the other workers being called 
to come and work at 9 a.m., the third hour, at noon, the sixth hour, at 3 p.m., the ninth hour, and late in the day, the very last hour before quitting time, the eleventh hour, none of them, notice this, none of them made any arrangement, any kind of demands for a contract of what they would be paid. But rather, we want to see this as all these other workers, they see it as a privilege to work in the Lord's vineyard for whatever, notice what it says in the text, he thinks is right. We trust you. You are the master. And your steward is your servant, and he will pay us what is right according to his righteousness. The Lord's righteousness. He will pay us very little or pay us much or whatever. It's, it's good. Whatever he's going to give us. That's enough. In this parable, then, we compare really only two different groups of church workers. Those who had what we might call a, a mercenary spirit and then those who are completely content. The first call of workers, the ones who murmured and complained later on about their pay, when all the other workers got that same pay for less work, they had this mercenary spirit that was only interested in the amount of money they could get. Self-centered, self-righteous, greedy, uh, selfish, only focused on themselves in the church, and failing to believe in and trust in the one that they work for by the grace of God to give them what is right, right in his sight, which is all by grace alone. Well, today in the church, that mercenary spirit still exists. Those who are only outwardly members of Christ's church, but, but really not true believers, are present in the visible church. By all appearances, these people... Uh, may also put in good work to serve, to serve within the congregation. They may be well respected by many of the, the members of the congregation, but their pay is not received out of thanks for God's generous grace. These people continue to remain blind, spiritually blind to the gospel of grace. Instead of thinking how truly unworthy I am to be in the kingdom in the first place because of my many, many sins and trespasses, these people think that they're entitled to be in, they're entitled to the work, they're entitled to the gifts, they're entitled to the good pay because of their work, not because of the servant of the master's grace. The servant of the master, the steward of the master, gives out the pay because he has paid the price ultimately on the cross, laboring in pain and suffering on their behalf. But all these people think I'm solely, it's solely because of how good a worker I am and how much time I put in that I get the benefits. Those blind, self-serving workers are also what we would call the hypocrites in the church that God only knows. He only knows truly who are his, and he knows clearly those who are not. His true workers in his kingdom who will never be unemployed and those who will be kicked out. Dear friends, only he knows your heart, your true heart, your heart of faith. Only he truly knows the light that shines in you in Jesus Christ that will lead you to continue to serve and work tirelessly in his kingdom because of all the blessings of God's grace that you've generously received continuously over and over again. Rewards of, of love, joy, peace, hope, comfort, confidence, and strength in Christ and his forgiveness of all your sins. As we continue with the second half of the text, it's going to be a little shorter, we see that among the first hour workers, there is also this, this grave accusation against the master, an accusation of injustice. But there is, dear friends, no injustice in the master and his steward Jesus. It's his kingdom, and he desires to give out generously. 
There is only a wealth of generous grace upon grace paid out equally to all workers in Jesus who chooses this equality with all, of his, all in his kingdom. While in his kingdom of his church, it looks like it's unfair and unjust because he gives it equally to all the workers, no matter if they worked only one hour or 12 hours, no matter if they worked a very short period of their life or all the years of their life. But for those who would begrudge the master and his steward's generosity, he says to those who judge his kingdom harshly, grumbling against the master and his grace for all, you're fired. You don't belong in this kingdom of grace in the first place. Because you reject both the master, God the Father, and you reject his servant, Jesus Christ, the steward, and so you are kicked out where you belong. In the devil's kingdom, instead, where you will continue to be that lazy, idle person that your sinful heart desires to be, apart from God's generosity forever. Finally, we are to see that in the Lord's vineyard of his church, there is no superiority either. We learn from Jesus that there is no comparing one person, one Christian, to another in his kingdom. Not one Christian is superior to another, no matter how long or little they work, whether apostle or pastor, no matter how outwardly good or sinful one is compared to another, we're all equal by God's grace through faith, and we all get the same pay and the same rewards. From John the baptizer to the thief on the cross, we're all equally saved by God's grace in Jesus. And we must be content, content with what the Lord gives, content with the rewards he gives. He gives now whatever is right and in, the kingdom, and in the kingdom to come for eternity. Well, as Peter and the other disciples are given many promises of rewards, but also warnings, we too, as Christians today, must hear the Lord's word, the words of promise and the words of warning, and believe him rightly, believe his teaching rightly in his word. None of us wants to be left out of the kingdom of God's grace in Christ. We are called to be laborers who labor in his vineyard of his church faithfully, not for riches, not for personal accolades or gains or because of any merits in us, but only because of the grace of God in Christ alone. I'm going to close with a few verses from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Colossians 1, 13 to 14, Paul reminds us as Christians called into his vineyard of this generous grace, this amazing grace that grounds us firmly in his kingdom, which has no end. Again, Colossians 1, 13 to 14, for he that is God, that is the master, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, working out there in the world, into his kingdom brought us into the kingdom of the Son, that is Jesus, that he loves, in whom we have what? Beautiful words of gospel. We have redemption. We have salvation from sin, death, and the devil, the forgiveness of sins. Take those gracious, generous words of the Lord with you. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus has finished all the work for your salvation, it is finished. He said it from the cross so that you can then, as his dear children, continue to work freely and willingly and openly without any concern in his kingdom, all because he is so generous to you. He is so generous to you as your master, as your savior, as your Lord, who saved you all by grace alone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, through grace alone. Amen.